the way to understand eternity is something like akin to the center of a space. So uh, imagine that you have a, a, a circle and the circle has a center, right? So the center actually doesn't exist in, in the circle. The, the center is actually virtual. It's a, it's a virtual point. It doesn't take up any space. It, it is a, it's like an invisible point. Invisible in the sense that it doesn't have dimension. But, but nonetheless, it is the center. It is that out of which the circle emanates. And it's that out of which uh, the circle, uh, how can I say this? The circle is identified or finds its common place. So all the, all the, the spokes of the wheel, let's say, on the, on the circle, all the spokes, all the radii, the indefinite radii from the center to the, to, the, to the periphery, all join together in that invisible point that has no, that has no, no uh, dimension. And so that's what eternity is to time. So eternity is the place where all time is resolved, out of which all time finds its extension, but it doesn't have duration. It is without duration. And it's, it's actually because it doesn't have duration that it becomes the synthesis and origin of all time. And so that's the best way to understand it. It's like you're not going to totally understand eternity, but that at least is the, the way that I can even approach it is to understand it in analogy to uh, to um, to space but in time now above the entrance to the platonic academy at athens we are told was an inscription which read let no one ignorant of geometry enter here the plane of this ancient geometry was conceived of as a void, as something which had the potential to receive existence only by the act of generation. It begins then with a single point. Only two instruments exist for the constructions of Euclidean geometry. The first is the straight edge, which allows the line to come into existence. The second is the compass, which brings the circle into existence by the act of rotation and joins the source to the perimeter. We will refer to this simple construction as the cosmic icon. This icon represents the cosmos as proceeding from God as the source and center of creation, expanding across an intermediary domain to the corporeal world in which we live our lives. Beyond that lies the chaos of outer darkness. So let me try to explain the idea of the icon. I should say that I'm basically a Platonist, and so this icon could be regarded as a Platonist icon. The ontological idea is this. Platonism, as well as uh, I think the major metaphysical traditions of antiquity have conceived of this integral cosmos as tripartite. Uh, this, I believe, is a very important idea which has been uh, largely lost even in, in academic circles and, and, and needs to be revived. So what are then these three basic components or levels of the cosmos? Well, starting at the lowest, what I call the corporeal world, 
This is the world as we normally experience it in our waking state. So it is a world uh, subject to two conditions, two bounds, namely space and time. So we, the corporeal world is a spatial temporal world. Now, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, namely the uh, eternal, you have uh, a realm, I call it the eternal, which is subject neither to space nor to time. So this is uh, a, a, a state implicit in Platonist philosophy and I think actually implicit in all the great philosophies of the world in one way or another. And between these two extremes, you have something called the intermediary world, which is subject to time, but not to space. Now, let me say that uh, in certain parts of the world, uh, these ideas are has still been current in my day, but in the West, uh, in the Western world, this is long forgotten. But uh, I have uh, focused upon this trichotomy and I have found that it is remarkably fruitful as a metaphysical principle. It, it sheds light on many things that um, otherwise we would not be able to grasp. And let me point out immediately that this tripartite division of the macrocosm is reflected in man himself, in the Anthropos, because the Anthropos is likewise tripartite. In traditional uh, terms, this is a tripartition into corpus, anima, spiritus, body, soul, and spirit, intellect. So that uh, this icon uh, applies to the microcosm as well as to the macrocosm. We are tripartite beings in a tripartite universe. And so, I've tried to revive this tripartite uh, understanding of both man and cosmos and apply it to uh, various questions of interest, beginning with the philosophy of physics. The philosophy of physics is greatly or deeply impacted by this idea of the tripartite cosmos. Uh, to give just one example, in a sense, the most striking of all, it can be rigorously affirmed that the mere existence of the intermediary domain, in other words, the existence of a domain subject to time, but not to space, has profound implications for physics. And in fact, it enables one on a rigorous ontological basis to prove the impossibility of Einsteinian physics. And it's very easy to see actually, because if you have an intermediary domain, you evidently have a globally defined concept of simultaneity. And as every physicist will understand, if in relativity theory, you do not have a globally defined concept of simultaneity, so very clearly the tripartite cosmos invalidates Einsteinian physics. So I, I mentioned this as an example that ontology does have something to say even on a scientific basis. So these are the ideas I've been developing and they have implications, as you might expect, not only to physics, but to many domains of primary interest. So let's just suffice for as an introduction. 
Thank you, Dr. Smith. So Jonathan, do you would you like to share a screen and show something? Well, I might have a question just about the oh, icon. Sure. Uh -huh. So in the image that was shown, the so the center would be the spirit would be the the spiritual, the line would be the intermediary, and the periphery would be the corporeal. Is that is that my, the right understanding? A exactly, Jonathan. That's exactly right. Okay. And so do you project this, 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 um, can you project this icon into three, three dimensional space in the sense of a mountain, let's say, or a pyramid with the point at the summit, um, representing the, uh, a connection of some kind to see it like this, if you flipped it, have you thought about, about it that way in, in any manner? I think it would weaken the. Uh, iconographic effect. Mm -hmm. All right. So, okay. So, do you want? Well, so, to... I might, I might want to bring up one other thing that Dr. Smith didn't mention here. Um, if I'm not presuming too much, um, Wolfgang, in um, in your book Physics and Vertical Causation, you talk about the the straight edge and the compass and how. The point um, is that the, the construction enters the picture and bestows a dynamic aspect in addition to its static form. A circle thus becomes something more than a closed circular arc. It comes to be perceived as a circular arc swept out by a compass, which, as you mentioned later on in the book, it, it performs the unlikely feat of bringing time into the picture, because as the as the compass sweeps out the arc, it's actually um, bringing time into the picture. Do you, do you, would you like to comment on that, Wolfgang? Well, let me just say uh, that I was thinking especially of the Platonist school. Uh, the Platonists seem to have uh, been very, very fascinated with geometry which they regarded as actually a tool uh, in, the, in the comprehension of metaphysics. And uh, they thought of geometry as concerned with geometric construction. In other words, they were not interested in regarding a geometric figure or diagram simply as, as that they regarded it as something to be constructed with the two geometric instruments, the straight edge and the compass. And uh, I don't want to say too much about that because it actually leads into very difficult uh, questions. It's not an easy subject, but I sense that uh, these meditations, if you will, these Platonist meditations on geometry as they understood it, were deeply meaningful in a metaphysical sense. And in particular, the understanding of time was related to the figure of the compass. Uh, for example, when Plato says, time is the moving image of eternity, uh, I think to, to make this somehow graspable, uh, the Platonist here is thinking of actually a compass sweeping out the circle. So, and incidentally, uh, in, 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 in this regard, let me say that the traditional Platonist view of time is circular. So, uh, let this be all for a first introduction to these Platonist ideas. And they are difficult, uh, but in my opinion, tremendously meaningful for a, an understanding of metaphysics. And, and I might add my experience of this icon, right, is that before really understanding this icon, I was stuck in the outer shell <laughs> of this reality. 
right? And so all my work in academia, in science and artificial intelligence and technology, et cetera, was an attempt to um, try to understand the whole of reality by only being able to examine the outer edge <laughs> of reality, right? And, uh, and actually science isn't even dealing with the outer edge of this icon here. It's dealing with kind of the quantitative attributes of the outer edge of this icon. And so um, to have that aha, right? To learn about Wolfgang's work and then realize kind of how we got to this point of only considering the quantitative attributes of this outer edge of this icon as being kind of the parts from which we are to then recreate the whole. Um, that was a very big reveal to me, right? And so then once you kind of acknowledge that, if you do agree with that and you say, whoa, <laughs> that sounds right, you know, then you do have to say, well, what is the real structure of the whole? And um, so this icon comes out of uh, traditional um, wisdom traditions uh, throughout, you know, mankind and, uh, and speaks of the, these three parts, right? The kind of outer edge, the, 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 the avaternal or the, the um, spiritus, and then kind of this middle world of uh, soul, I think, and psyche. And it's just a wonderful way to begin to, you know, reapproach <laughs> um, our understanding and try to make sense of things. Jonathan? No, I, I think I I think I I I understand the 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 icon. I think the reason why I was pointing to the the possibility of flipping it is mostly if we want I think that if we want to use your image as a key, let's say, to sometimes to understanding sacred art. There are some moments where we would need to do that. Guinot, Guinot in the symbolism of the cross, he traces this, he kind of does that, where he he, cre he creates the notion that the center of the circle can also be seen as an axis and that the periphery of the circle can be seen as a coil. And that would account for the relationship between the different microcosms and macrocosms and how they kind of embed each other, uh, embed themselves into each other. Um, and so if, I don't know if maybe this could be an interesting possibility of showing maybe some traditional or some images the, from the Christian tradition and try to see how they can connect to this image. Would that make sense? Well, one example actually uh, of, of a three-dimensional version of this would be a church itself. And so the Orthodox Church would have a dome with Christ at the at the top of the dome, uh, and then the circle moving down into a square. And so you would have the, the the dome coming down, being held by four pendentives, and on those four pendentives would be, let's say, the corners, which would which would be an extreme actually version of that circle or or even a more embodied version of that circle down in the let's say the four manifestations of the one uh, and you'll see that represented as the four evangelists or as the four beasts in ezekiel um and so if you if you project that image into space there are ways to to account for other traditional forms like architecture um like uh, some of the icons that exist in in the uh, in the church and also that say the iconographic programs that are in the church will have that form. So a good example, another example would be the dome itself. In in traditional Byzantine churches, the dome represents the ascension itself. And so the earliest domes would have Christ up at the axis point in the middle of the dome. And then around the periphery of the dome, you would have the mother of God, Mary, which would be directly under him. And then you would have the 12 disciples, which would be circling the dome. And so you have that, 
that relationship between the principle and its manifestation, right, from, from Christ as the divine man into the 12 that are, has a cosmic aspect, but also has a, has the notion of the body of the church itself. And so you can kind of see that, uh, manifested that way so that's one of the reasons why i wanted to 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 see if you had thought about how you can project it that way because i think that i think that the icon or the image of the center and the periphery is obviously the most basic image to understand reality and i i use it in different guises uh all the time so so i i don't know much about science and so it's hard for me to to know, like, let's say why it invalidates Einsteinian uh, physics, but I definitely see how that structure is. You can read, you can, you can use the center and periphery as a, as a structure to explain everything. You can basically explain in the entire cosmos with that, with that basic structure. I, uh, I guess I've been accustomed to differentiate iconography from sacred art and sacred architecture at large. Um, I, I, I certainly agree completely with what you say about mm -hmm. sacred architecture, mm -hmm. uh, but I always regarded iconography as a, as a little part of that. I, I always regarded icons as two-dimensional. Am I am I wrong there? You know more about this than I do. Well, I think I think so. I think it depends on if you understand that icons were do, are not divorced from the sacred space. That is, icons were developed as iconographic programs. The, the idea of the panel icon, there's nothing wrong with a panel icon, but in the Byzantine and the midi in the Romanesque period or in the Byzantine period, the icon would have been first and foremost an experience as a uh, spatial relationships in the church. And so certain images would appear in certain places within the church. So the Eastern apse would have an image, for example, in the Byzantine tradition, for example, the Eastern apse would have an image of the mother of God with Christ, uh, pre-incarnate Christ in her center. And then on the Western side of the church, you would have, for example, the falling asleep of the Virgin, where now Christ is holding the soul of the mother of God in her hands. Now, if you, if you look at the image of the, the death of the mother of God or the, the, the falling asleep, and you see Christ holding the soul of the Virgin in, her, in his hands, it's very confusing if you don't understand that it was originally understood in space as, a, as an answer to the Eastern apse and the, the mother of God with Christ in her center. So it's like a reflection of east and west, sunrise, sunset, right? This, this kind of inversion that happens at the beginning and at the end. So I think that in order to really understand icons, we have to remember that they were, they were mostly spatially uh, experienced inside iconographic programs. And this from the time of, of a of Constantine, right, right, right at the outset, the earliest churches that were created in the Constantinian period used this apocalyptic, apocalyptic imagery in in the church architecture, and then also integrating gospel stories and different images. So, although yes, the image itself, if you look at it, it is in some ways a vertical, right? It's a vertical relationship. There isn't much going on in that in the in the spatial. They are meant to inhabit a uh, a three D space. So, I see. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, uh, one of the things that I was talking with Wolfgang about before you joined us was the difference between uh, traditional art and then art after the Renaissance, when more and more perspective came in, more emphasis on form, more emphasis on depth in the image, and I was just guessing because I'm no expert on iconography, but I was guessing that um, if, if we go back to his icon of the, the ebb eternal being a place with no time and space, and then the intermediary being a place with only time, it seems to me that, that iconography fits into the intermediary in the sense that there is, it's mostly two dimensional. So there's not a sense of space within the work itself. 
but there is a sense of time because some of your icons show all of time at one time, but in a two-dimensional image. And I don't know if, if that's at all interesting idea. But yeah, well, for sure, I icons, one of the advantages. One of yeah, well, one of the advantages of icons is is the possibility of showing simultaneity, you know, and it's the difference between a story and an image. A story will will string events in a pattern, right, in a line, whereas in, the, in an icon, you can experience it, the entire story in a simultaneous uh, image, and then the the uh, spatial relationships of the elements uh, will be meaningful rather than how they fit in sequence of time. So it's, it's, it is a play between space and time because obviously an image is a fully spatial image. It, it, I mean, it's, it's a spatial uh, experience because it, you're, you're experiencing it, but you're also, it's a, it's a window into simultaneity because you get the possibility. Maybe I can show the images. I did make a few images last year, maybe some of them two years ago, which were trying to encompass, I call them, you know, images of everything or, or cosmic images would try to encompass all of this narrative into one single image. Um, do you need to sh give me, can I share, do you think? Yes, yes please do. Okay, let's please see. Do. Share screen. I think you have to give me permission. Did I not? Uh, oh, you, you are quite right, Jonathan. My apologies. Go ahead now. All right. Share screen. Sorry, I might have to just move this up though a little bit. Whoops. Okay. Okay. So these are, these are two, I haven't carved these yet. They're just designs. And so these are two, um, efforts that I, I made to to create images or cosmic images which would try to encompass let's say entire narratives into single images and so on the left you have this image of the cosmic mountain the co the mountain of paradise um and it's it's also a commentary in some ways on Saint Ephraim's hymns on paradise and also Saint Gregory of Nyssa's life of Moses. All of these, this these types of structures coming in at the same time. So if you look at the image, uh, you will see, of course, this different characters appear several times in the same image. You have Adam and Eve appearing at the tree, and then Adam and Eve covering themselves with the fig leaves. And then Adam and Eve covered with the garments of skin. And then you also have an increase of division from the singularity of the cross into a splitting in half until you have Adam and Eve completely separated. And then the thorns, which have, you know, multiplicity, uh, let's say, uh, multiplicity itself as the, as the thorns. Um, and then you have, of course, Adam and Eve transformed ultimately into the mother of God and St. John up at the tree of life, which is shown as the cross. Um, and so these, these types of image. So you also have, so St. Ephraim talks about how the rivers of these four rivers talked about this idea of the dome and how the dome moves into four, into a square, how the circle moves into a square. And you see that in, uh, in the image of paradise itself. And so if you, if you can represent it, you get a sense of this, this dome, which becomes a square with the wall of paradise. So it's also a church. And you have these four currents which come down and which are mitigated as they get further and further away from the, uh, from the source, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are, these are a few, you see, so in now, the, the other one is, of course, the image of the flood. And so you have this, let's say microcosm of this so this image here of uh, of paradise is now inserted in the background as the just the tree and the mountain the wall and the four rivers and the flood comes right up to the to the the, the wall of paradise so basically all of this here in the first image is now what's represented here um, so it's also a way to kind of show how these microcosms fit into each other. 
And then the arc, of course, becomes a microcosm as well of the hierarchy, which we see in the different images. And so, you know, with the birds, the birds above, and then the animals below, and then death, of course, at the bottom, and residues of civilization, residues of religion, residues of animality, all these residues which are in, in the mouth of Hades, which is, this is down here below. Um, these are all pulled out of, of course, traditional images. This is, it's a condensation of traditional images, but all of the elements are taken from different iconographic uh, strains. So let's say the mouth of hell or the mouth of death is a very ancient image that we find in iconography. Um, same with the Leviathan. This is, <clears throat> of course, the Leviathan, but it's also Jonah's monster. Um, there are different elements to 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 look at. How it, I tried to pull it all into one, into into one, very condensed images. So, what do you hope people? What what impact do you hope this will have on people who? Well, it, these particular it. images, I think. <laughs> What they do for people is they, first of all, surprise them because they they at first get a sense that there's a coherence, but they, they can't access it rationally right away. Mm -hmm. um, and then slowly, if they know their Bible, this is, of course, it's mostly useful for people that know their Bible. Mm -hmm. If they know their Bible, then things will start to appear and start to, to kind of take form and, and make sense. And then they'll start to realize that for example, you know, the crown of thorns, which is around the the mm. um, paradise here, is also lifted up by Christ as being this mm. ultimate, you know, apophatic image uh, above. Um, and then people start to notice how the image comes together and to realize the the deep coherence of the biblical story, the deep coherence of these images um, and so, yes, that is what I'm hoping to to accomplish with these images. Yeah, that's um, just a kind of personal story as I have, um, or experience as I've gone deeper into Christianity myself, and I look at just the symbolism of the cross, right? It's amazing how much um, has opened to me from just contemplating that icon Whereas before, before I was open to a religious um, life, I guess, I had dismissed that icon entirely, right? And even though I had been, you know, raised nominally Christian. Um, but, you know, to me, that's what is really um, kind of the burning question, right, is if this approach that we have to, you know, knowledge and understanding today, this kind of science physics based in time sequential cause and effect <laughs> um, versus really um, engaging with symbols and, and the reality of the symbols themselves, right? Uh, as I go deeper into that, it's just opening up a whole new world of new worlds of understanding that were kind of, you know, excluded before yeah. because these were just regarded as mythological and something from an earlier time and not really of value to the modern man. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, let me just here, maybe I can show this image and show how it connects to Dr. Smith's uh, circle and periphery. So this is, of course, this is now it's a carving that I've done of, Christ pulling St. Peter from the waters. And I think that in this image, we see a very per a very beautiful version of what uh, Wolfgang is talking about in terms of the relationship between center periphery and something we could call memory. Uh, there are different ways to represent the intermediary world. Memory is definitely one of them. Uh, and so we have, of course, Christ who represents in this in this image, represents the, the the center and then peter who is falling into the periphery he's falling into the periphery because he forgets his connection to christ and and he he thinks that it's on his own he thinks that he can do it all by himself 
that he can walk on the waters without being connected to the incarnation. And because of that, that's why he falls. And in, and in calling out to Christ, right, in remembering God, remembering Christ, remembering the heart, all these images we find in traditional uh, parlance, then he is able to be pulled back out of the chaos and stand firmly on the, on the multiplicity that is the world. Um, and in this image, I wanted to show how Christ, the way that he engages with multiplicity, is he transforms it into glory. And so when his foot touches, when his foot touches the waters, it actually sends golden spirals out from the place where he touches the, the, the periphery, we could say. Let me just interject, Jonathan, that these carvings are perfectly beautiful. They're amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I've never seen uh, this style of carving. It's is is that unique to to you? It's well, it's based on. I mean, it's based on Byzantine style, but of course, it you know we. How can I say this? We we're not idiosyncratic. We, we're all, I mean we're not uh, nostalgic for the past. I'm not trying to make pastiche images of ancient art. I'm trying to create images that both connect with the past and with the ancient forms, but also have enough element of of surprise to make you um, to not make you ignore it. Let's say, or to not make you walk by and think that it's. Let me show you, here's an image of Jonah, which is, I, I chose these images because they're related to the question of the, of the icon. And so here, again, we have a similar image as the image of St. Peter, which is that Jonah is being eaten by the monster. He's being eaten by that. He's being eaten, sorry, what did I just do? He's being eaten by this Leviathan here that's in the water by the, the, the sea monster. Um, and then, and then he says, from the belly of death, I cry, I cried and you heard my voice. And so from the belly of this, this chaos and multiplicity, he remembers God and therefore is brought out of the waters into the city. Beautiful. Beautiful. So we right, so the, um, you know the the multiplicity with the corporeal world and the um, Christ or God with the eternal world here from Wolfgang's icon. Yes, well, it's to me the way that I see the icon, the, I see it really as a as a fractal structure, and so it it represents itself relatively at different levels. And so, for example, let's say. You can let's say if you have a um, let's say you have a group, a, a team, or a, a nation, or something, then you can see how that structure will represent itself, and there'll be stand-ins. Let's say a stand-in for the center would be the king. Of course, the king is not spiritual; the king is an embodied person. But it because it manifests itself uh, fractally, then you can understand that there are images which are more appropriate to to see it at it in its highest form. And so of course, um, in this image, the, the, you don't see the center it's up here, right? It's up in what he's looking at. It's, it's up where he's looking at up here. Sometimes it's represented as a, sometimes it's represented as this. I don't know if you've ever seen this, which is the, which is the divine glory. Uh, it's a divine darkness actually. And so usually you'll have a dark, a dark semicircle at the top of many images and that it moves from darkness into light. So it really is this kind of apophatic image of the transcendent. Um, so here's a, here's a hostile version of the, of this question Beautiful. where, where now it is in some ways, this, this connection here between the center and the the periphery which is held by the intermediary being and is of course the source of it is the transcendent the transcendent up here is now more of a hostile image it's more of a 
pushing down or preventing it from devouring the uh, devouring the world. Mm -hmm. um, so there are obviously there are different ways to represent. The, the, sometimes it's a beneficial relationship. Sometimes it can be a hostile relationship, depending on the different the things you want to emphasize. So Jonathan, is that Saint Michael? Yes. Yeah, it's Saint Michael killing the Leviathan. Yeah, you see that in Revelation it says Saint Michael, the great the great dragon was uh was pushed down by Saint Michael and the the, the Leviathan. Well, I wanted to ask a clarifying question of Dr. Wolfgang Smith. Um in, in order to ask the question, I'm going to read a quote of yours um, from <clears throat> another one of your books, Dr. Smith. Do you want me to stop the share? Maybe it'll be a good no, idea. No, you, you can leave it on there. It's beautiful to look so at. beautiful to look at. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The, the eternal realm is inherently the cosmos in its integrality before it is fragmented into innumerable bits and pieces through the imposition of temporal and spatial bounds. Yet despite this partition into spatio-temporal fragments, every corporeal entity X remains undivided in its very being. This gets at identity, <clears throat> gets at multiplicity, but it also made me wonder about the eternal realm. Is there anything above the eternal realm or is the eternal realm the, the aboveness? <laughs> uh, it's a wonderful question. The answer that I would give is this. I am presupposing a categorical distinction between God and the creation. Um, my ontology is uh, a cosmic ontology. In other words, I do not engage in any kind of theology. I engage in in straight cosmic uh, ontology. So uh, the cosmos is one thing and God is infinitely above the cosmos. But I don't write about God. I, I write about the cosmos. So, so your, I, your icon is, is the cosmos, but God is infinitely other. God is infinitely other. He's not part of the... Uh, the, the, the icon refers to the cosmos, not to God. So, Jonathan, maybe that answers your question about why it's uh, flat rather than um, a mountain. Because, mm -hmm. because God is at the top of the mountain. God is above the top of the mountain. Let's, let's put it that way. 